Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome back to another episode of Intent Wise's podcast. And today, I am super excited to have Boyan Gaik as as my guest uh, on this session. Boyan is uh, a friend from the industry. Uh, we all know him as a, you know the co-founder and ex CEO of Helium Ten. Uh, we'll get into more about you know what that journey was like for Boyan. But what what is exciting to me is uh, you know having been on an entrepreneurial journey myself. I think there's a lot to learn, and the few conversations I've had with Boyan, I, I learn a lot every single time. I don't think today will be any different. Boyan, thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me, Srinath, and uh, just. Uh... We're also neighbors, like we, we're sort of friends and, and industry friends, but we're neighbors, which, uh, which is a nice thing. So we can, we can share the lovely weather as it is in Southern California today. So uh, for those of you who are not in Southern California. I I, I remember you, your, uh, one of my, your first messages to me, hey, let's meet in person. Yes, let's meet in person. <laughs> yeah, the world, it, it's nice when, especially post-COVID, it's, sort of, it's nice when you have sort of personal interaction. When I saw that you're in San Diego, I was like, yes, <laughs> there's a guy I want to meet in person. Yes. Yeah. So, so you build one of the most well-known software brands in our space, which is Helium 10. Now, first of all, congrats. Thank you. And, <laughs> and that must feel extremely satisfying. Definitely, yeah, and like I'd be lying if I say like, oh, I I don't care. It's like it, it's satisfying at, at uh, a lot of levels, and it's like I'm I'm thinking to sort of Maslow hierarchy of needs. Like Helium ten for me personally, get a lot of those needs, like all the way from from one to five, I guess. Uh, I was there, there's sort of material side of things, so yeah. it was a it, it was not a bad kind of business, right. uh, so. There's there's a there's an element of satisfaction there, right? You you make some money and and the the life becomes sort of uh, more convenient. Like you go to Disneyland and now you can buy fast pass. So you don't have to wait in line for an hour and a half. Like sort of, ooh. or like you go see a, a game. Now yeah. you can actually see a game with your own eyes as opposed to bringing binoculars and like you're in nosebleeds and something's happening out there so there there was an element of that that uh, not not sort of the most uh, the most satisfying thing like you, you you go to kind of different levels there like winning i i i, I would lie if i said like just kind of being su- successful is not is not satisfying so yeah there is friendly competition in space uh we're all providing value if i can provide value better than someone else i sort of feel good about it like no like i, I don't i don't to pretend that that doesn't matter uh, building, exactly. building, sort of creating value. It's like when, when you're a child, like putting putting pieces together, like assembling a puzzle, uh, putting Legos together. Though I was never really good at that. It's like it it felt good to sort of build things. Like have the, have the resources, have the capability, have the team, <clears throat> have the opportunity to build things. So that also felt good. Yeah. And the most satisfying part was actually impacting the lives of people around me. It's like that was a. Uh, that that's a sort of pinnacle of my Helium 10 experience, both internally and externally. So internally, pretty large team. We, at, at one point, we got to about 300 people. And when I look back at sort of experiences that some of my employees had, they their their lives improved a lot, or at least to an extent during during that time. Like things that they were able to do, things that they learned, things yeah. that they were able to deliver, uh, sort of changed or three, four, five, six years that they spent in Helium 10. So that was that was satisfying experience. Most satisfying moment was actually when a customer asked for a selfie. That was a, that was a that. <laughs> fair experience for me because someone recognized the shirt. It was yeah. early on and yeah. asked for a selfie. That was kind of awkward. <laughs> that. Like my kids uh, avoid doing that with me, but here's a person that hey. just wanted to express gratitude and sort of commemorate the, the moment. It's like, okay, we're here together. It's like when when I look when I talk to customers, like I'll go to a conference and just have a conversation with people, and yeah. they're sort of happy that company like Helium Ten exists. Yeah, so it makes me happy. So so very satisfying in a lot of ways. Leaving Helium Ten was like it, it was not an easy decision, but mm-hmm. it was it was good decision because yeah. As as uh, as you know, things have changed as as Helium Ten grew and and as businesses grew, like grow, things change. Uh, Helium Ten acquired two thousand nineteen by Assembly. So back in the day, two people, Sandeep and Adam, 
very talented, very ambitious, very skilled. They invested a lot in growing the business, kind of expanding assembly. Uh, yeah. 2021, factory joined assembly. Uh, we hired uh, Rahul uh, as, a, as a chief operating officer. It's like very impactful, very, very sort of kind of visionary person with, with uh, kind of strength to actually see things through. So at, like somewhere in 2022, I, I, I sort of started thinking about the way I contribute to the business. Like, yeah. Am I supporting the business in the best possible way? And am I, get, am I getting out of the business the satisfaction I want to get out of the business? So, so yeah. I, I sort of realized that in, in a lot of ways, I'm sort of holding people back. Like a lot of smart people join the company. I have my perspective, they have their perspectives. And in a lot of like in a lot of ways, their perspective is actually more more objective and and healthier for the company than mine might be. So, 2022, like sat down with uh, Sandeep with Rahul, we decided that it's, it's like it's time. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, not an easy decision, but one that had to be made. And uh, I I'm sort of enjoying the fruit of that of that decision. But uh, that. Well, was- I mean. What an amazing journey uh, and the scale to which I think um, you know, Helium 10 got to under your leadership. I'm, I have so many questions about that. Uh, but uh, before we go there, you know, share with us, you grew up in Serbia, you're now in Southern California, built an amazing brand, and you're going on to the next gig. Just walk us through that journey. Show us a trailer. Mm. Uh, I, I, had, I had plenty of time to serve put pieces in that trailer so it could be kind of a full featured movie. Not not a fun one, but like lengthy one. Uh I actually like I grew up in Bosnia. Oh, okay. Yeah. But, but I, I I came to the States from, from Serbia. So so I grew up in Bosnia and I was I, I recently learned a term uh uh, uh a mathlete. It was like oh where was that when I was a kid? <laughs> oh nerd. Oh uh, no, no, no. I was a mathlete. Oh, you're a mathlete. Okay. I grew were up you, weren't you a voluntary math teacher? Or or were you just a math teacher? Was that your was that was that a job ever for you? Uh, I was uh, at some point I, I, I taught math. Yeah. So I started as sort of, kind of that was my early aspirations to be a mathematician and I competed like national champion, Olympics, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, pursued that career with kind of great vigor, and I moved. I moved from Bosnia to Serbia for university when I was seventeen, which is when the like some people might be familiar with that the, the war of Balkans. Yeah, not the happiest time. Uh, so starting from kind of age of seventeen, I had to sort of figure it out on my own. So I did various things. I I I was tutoring, so math tutor. Uh, I was a construction worker, and it's unskilled. So it's like like just carry things from place A to place B, get paid for that. I uh, I taught uh, math and computer literacy to visually impaired children. That was, that was probably the hardest job I, I ever had. It was mentally demanding. Like when you when you when you like when you see your students and 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 you see the disability, but you also see their willingness to grow and, and do something with their lives. But you're also aware of the environment. Like what were, what level of math was that? Uh, there were high school. This was our high school. It was high school. Okay. K, K through twelve school, but I was I was uh, teaching high school, uh, so that was that was demanding job. Uh, I I spent two years actually at uh, uh, Belgrade University, so so I had short academic career, but kind of quickly realized that it's not it's not fulfilling the way I thought it would be. Uh, yeah. So shifted from academia to industry late 1990s, where I met uh, many codes. So the, the founder of Helium 10, the, the two of us met 25 years ago, essentially. I was still in Serbia. He was in California. He was looking for help. Like he needed a coder. Like that was his turn. I was like, I'm a coder. So, <laughs> Uh, and that's the that's the original founder of Helium Ten, is it? Uh, yes. So he's the he's the main founder of uh, of, of Helium Ten. He he has a great 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 vision, so a very inspiring leader. Uh, came to the came to the states in two thousand two. So I, I worked with Manny remotely for a few years, then came to the states, and then we we spent a little bit of time kind of working together and then separating. So we went through a few businesses. 
every every business that I was involved with uh, was essentially bootstrap software company, uh, yes. and and that that sort of informed how I think about work. Because if you, you you have that experience, when you're bootstrap, you like you really have to kind of deliver value to your customers. Uh, you cannot, and also you have to do it quickly. You, you cannot afford long sales cycle. It's like you may have greatest idea in the world, but you don't have resources to build it and then wait a year for someone to decide that uh, there's budget now for, for that solution. Like you have to do it, it quickly. It, 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 it brings a razor sharp focus to kind of value delivery, basically. <laughs> yes. And, and also you become really allergic to negative feedback because <laughs> you know that like your your brand is is what sort of drives value for you so if people say oh this does not work for me it's like that that hurts if they say it publicly that's even even worse <laughs> so uh that's but that's already informed how i think about businesses so ran through through a few bootstrap software companies back in kind of early 2000s we had uh, like ad technology marketing technology platform we ran it's actually number two property on Alexa, which was going kind to of measure uh, traffic for websites. We had a website that was ranked number two. Uh, we were generating, uh, we were storing more than 100 million pop-ups per day. So oh, wow. 20 years ago, if you got a pop-up uh, in your browser, I'm responsible. So you've, uh, you've, been, you've been on the bootstrap SaaS entrepreneurship uh track yeah. yes that's that's essentially the entirety of my career yes. and, and helium 10 was like number what number six or oh, wow. seven. <laughs> like it was pretty far down down the road and there were some say almost success stories like that uh uh martech platform that we built we had conversations with public company acquisition and mm -hmm. then dot-com bubble bursts and kind of all the businesses just disappear. So, so the deal that we had was uh, equity only, sure. and that equity was worth exactly nothing six <laughs> months later. So it's like, thinking, yeah, this is success. <laughs> oh, no, it's not. Then we no, went to uh, so like a, a consumer desktop software. Kind of, yep. You can look at the opportunity. You can hear what people are talking about, and you jump into that. Uh, and consumer desktop software, 2003, 4, 5, 6, there is anti-spyware, anti-malware, anti it's like just sort of a productivity tools for, for uh, Windows desktop. And we had a nice kind of run. We, we grew that business uh, to sort of five plus million in, in uh, ARR. Uh, conversations around uh, so sort of getting funding, growing faster, and then our uh, sort of aggressive marketing and aggressive sales caught up with us. So something happened there where it's kind of, outside my control outside our control uh we lost for two years and and that led to sort of ultimate demise of that business you you might have a good product you might actually have sort of quality service that you're delivering you might have a like strong go-to-market but then you miss something like the market changes underneath your feet sure. your the, the timing is wrong uh bigger competitor comes around so so like four there's five forces there there's always something someone out there kind of trying to to do better and sort of deliver more value than, than you're delivering so like timing has to be right uh, effort has to be there all the things have to have to align so we went through sort of ad technology marketing technology consumer desktop software ios applications so i felt we were we were sort of late in 2011 like 2000 late 2010 early 2011 we started turning apps and and i was already frustrated that we took sort of too long it was like a year after uh, Apple launched the App Store. Like hindsight, that was actually opportunity to double down. But when we moved in that direction, I was not, I was not sure if the growth potential is still there. It's like I thought, oh, we're, we're too late to, to this market. So we didn't really embrace it fully. And then we, we sort of paid the price. Like we sort of continued, built a lifestyle business. A lot of these businesses got to the point where there's enough value where you can kind of roll it into another business. You start a new product, you start a new service line. Kind of shift a little bit. You build a lifestyle business, but not not the one of size or helium ten. So helium ten came at the end of sort of that journey that had multiple milestones and multiple uh, questionable successes. What 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 put helium ten on a different path for you? Like, uh, and perhaps you can talk about like how did it start, and when did you realize okay you're onto something big that's just different from your past experiences. 
the many many and I talked about helium 10 and get, but by the way for the benefit of the audience Manny was your co-founder Man, Man, yeah Manny, Manny so, so he's like the, the most most of the businesses that I was involved with uh, were kind of envisioned by many codes and sabotaged by me <laughs> envisioned like, by many codes and sabotaged by you <laughs> so, so he, he's the guy that will see it's like he will see the shining object top of the hill it's like let's go and get it yeah and and my job is to sort of think about product engineering, like R and D, like how do you actually get? How it? do you get there? Yeah. How do you get there? So so like I, I developed this habit of of just looking like five feet in front of me, where he's looking sort of five miles out, and and you're like the it's good, you, it's good dynamic. You're like my co-founder, you know, like okay, it's like reality, practical. Yes. <laughs> so so in two thousand like in, in two thousand thirteen for he's also a person of sort of great energy. That sometimes can be overwhelming. So, so he's he's your eighteen hours a day, seven days a week kind of guy. Like, so here's something that we want to do, and this is the only thing that we do. Yeah. So I can handle that for a few years, but not uh, so indefinitely. So 2013-14, we sort of, we took a break. Then 2016, he he reached out, and and in the meantime, he started his Amazon business. I stayed with our iOS business, so he started the Amazon business. And he saw the opportunity on 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 sort of on the educational side of things. Like, hey, I'm going through this journey, and it's really painful, and I made mistakes. So I'm going to share my experience with other people out there. See what happens. And he was he 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 had an Amazon 3P seller business. Yes, that's how he started. So, so private, he he pivoted from iOS from App Store to Amazon Store because he saw sort of similarities there. So when you when you look at product listing and then you when you look at app listing and the same thing like here's a title here are a few images here are a few keywords you all you need to sort of drive demand put something on the back end to to kind of meet that demand that's it like sort of rinse repeat so sure he, he pivoted from apps to Apple App Store to Amazon products or uh, uh, 3P store uh, and uh, he reached out in 2016 he moved to Irvine I was in San Diego and he wanted. He wanted us to talk, like, hey, I have this idea, and there could be software here. I was like, sure, come down to San Diego, let's have a dinner, let's talk about it. He says, no, 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 you come up to Irvine and let's talk about it. I was like, dude, you need me, I don't need you. <laughs> like, you come down to San Diego, and that was the end of the conversation. Like, he he wouldn't he wouldn't drive down, I wouldn't drive up. So that was early 2016. I was like, okay, whatever. It's like your problem. And That's you didn't it. meet. You didn't meet. So we did that, not that moment. We did not meet 2016. We actually met early 2017. It's like a year later, his need was kind of more intense. It's like, hey, I, I really need you. And I I was in this sort of lifestyle engagement where I realized that I'm sort of projecting my aspirations to the rest of my family. So I would leave work at 3 p.m. because I can. It's like it's yeah. like money is just sort of coming in, uh, AM, PM. Uh, and then I, I would go pick up my son and then we'd go to the field, soccer field, and we would work on skills. And I would I would watch videos. I, I was never sort of big football, like big soccer kind of expert. I became one. Like I, I got coaching That's license awesome. and I realized like, this is probably not healthy for either one of us. <laughs> So he should do his thing. I should probably go do something else. So, yeah. so when many reached out in 2017, like the timing was much better. Uh, and uh, I also came, right? So, so I, I drove to Irvine. Yeah, you drove to Irvine. Yeah. I, uh, I joked with, with many and with our uh, circle of friends. Like many is very sort of accommodating person. He will, he will give you as much time as you need to realize that uh, he's right and you're wrong, right? So that's <laughs> Like, yeah, take your time. So <laughs> yeah, in 2017, uh, I, I drove up to Irvine and, and uh, Guillermo Puyol. So many, many uh, codes and Guillermo Puyol, they, they co-founded Pixel Labs, which was uh, uh, essentially education program, training company, uh, AMPM podcast, for example, that was, that was sort of Pixel Lab property. There was a, a, a Facebook group uh, and uh, they wanted to sort of pivot into software. They needed support on, on product engineering side of things. So timing is really good. Like they say, hey, are you interested? I said, sure, I am. So I, I joined in 2017 as sort of technical co-founder once we, once 
pixel apps pivot, pivoted to technology and that's where Helium 10 essentially became Helium 10. Right? Wow. Why Helium 10? Why the name? Because you rise to the top. So AMPM podcast uh, tagline was sort of rise to the top. So what rises to the top? Helium. It's like ah. Helium. And then 10, uh, there, there's sort of two stories. One, 10 is uh, binary two. One zero. Yeah. So I was like, yeah. okay. And Helium and atomic uh, number two. So, but that was not the real story. The real story is you were 10 out of 10. So, so the, the sort of commingled kind of two metaphors rising to the top and you're 10 out of 10, but also helium.com was, uh, was occupied. So you took 10. already taken. So we needed something else. Okay. Helium 10. Sure. We'll go with that. It's pretty, I actually happy with, with branding because early on, there's this sort of desire to explain who you are with your name. So you're, you become amzresearch.com, which kind of limits you to yeah. what you were initially. So it, it takes a little bit of effort to build a brand, but it's kind of domain agnostic brands usually easier to build and support, like Nike. It doesn't really say I'm running around in, in full shape. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that was our origin of, of Genesis. Of and what and 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 you know, I think I think we all go through these journeys and these moments in time. Share with me that moment where you're sitting there and you're like, oh wow, we are on to something big here from a opportunity standpoint. Uh, I came out of my cave. Like I spent the year in my cave, hmm. angry all day, every day. It's like <laughs> my my engineering team is is was uh, was back back in the day. We still are in Moldova, which is ten hours ahead. So I have to get up at five to drive to Irvine to be there by seven to be in the traffic. I talk to folks over there. I'm on on my phone. I get really angry <laughs> because I had to get up early and not a morning person. So it was. It was pretty intense, and then things break all the time. Like uh, 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 Werner Vogels, uh, AWS CEO, CTO, it's like that was sort of his famous. Like things break all the time. Oh. Things really do break all the time, sure. uh, and you have to fix them all the time while you're adding features on top of that. And in spring 2018, I go to SellerCon in Orlando, uh, and that's where I got to actually interact with the customers in person kind of at scale and how many customers like what what, what is the customer scale at that point if you're able to share right so early 2018 we were let's say about three to five thousand between three and five thousand customers so so there's already decent customer base the user base was, was much bigger so so wow. we, we had a free tier uh, and and sort of decent amount of value delivered through through, through free so premium. Our conversion rate might be like two or three percent, but there are, let's say let's say four thousand paying customers at that, at that point. I talk to customers, but these are more scripted, more arranged. I'll I'll find them on Facebook group and send them a message DM. Like they'll complain about something. I was like, okay, I want to hear from you, and I'll I'll send them a DM like, hey, I'm CTO of Helium Ten. I'd like to talk, and then. We talk and people are usually very friendly when you reach out, reach out to them. But uh, that, that was sort of more scripted. It's like, let's talk about issues. Let's talk about the opportunities. And then tra you transition into, let's talk about your business, not just sort of buttons that you want to see on the page. So, but it's, it's sort of sc scripted one-on-one. -on -one, uh, and, and that seller con was more like, you just walk around and you, you meet people. Yeah. Uh, and I met, I met customers. I met non-customers. Uh, I also met my competitors, sure. and like I, I realized that my customers really like me to the <laughs> kind of, to the level that they will get selfies with me, which to <laughs> me was sort of a sign that there's a need and yeah. we're meeting that need. So it's it's not just that the need exists, but sort of there's clear problem. And what we have now, even though it's like the technologist in me was frustrated with the quality of product. Kind of internally, but it was sort of good enough for them to be really excited. Yeah. Just imagine what I can do if I have another year, if I have a larger team, if I make investments, like how excited they will be then when I actually have something that I'm happy with as opposed to something that I'm frustrated with. But then I looked at competition and like part of the challenge in my conversation with Manny was sort of sizing the opportunity. He says the opportunity oh. here, okay, fine. 
every opportunity has competitive space, right? Like who are your competitors? And he drops few names. I like, those are not real competitors. It's like, yeah. Who are the, like, give me the name, like big name that I know. Like, no, those are the competitors. So in 2018, spring of 2018, I, I got to validate problem space and existing solution space. And, and so I realized that uh, there's clear opportunity and that we are not really being challenged at that point. Like sort of the, kind of our competition was, while well, I expected to see sort of huge tech companies coming from sort of technology backgrounds, like my expectations were just here and, uh, and the level of competition, the people are well-intended they just did not understand technology and scale. Like, sort of how, sure, it works for 50, but yeah. how do you scale that to work for 50,000? Like things yeah. will start breaking. Every, every zero you add to your customer base or user base, things need to be reimagined. And I, I sort of realized that there, there's so many, that so many things align. Like, so when you, when you, if you're a surfer, and I'm not, but I, I look at people there and I talk to them, it's like you have to, and get the way your timing has to be right, but also your technique has to be right. A few things have to align for that kind of nice, smooth ride. And I, I, I sort of realized that we have a lot of things aligning really, really nicely for us. So that was that was sort of the, the aha moment where I went from sort of like, yeah. hey, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if we're really adding value to it's like, we just need yeah. to. Yeah, you've got, you got, you got happy customers taking selfies. Like, all right, yeah. let's do this. Exactly. Like, <laughs> Makes, yeah. and and i think um, it is so hard to get to that point i mean i i i mean you know i in our case uh, i would in our early stages i would look for the expression wow on a demo from a customer like every time you hear it like okay fine like okay this is something you need to keep going <laughs> but those moments are so important you know you can you, you feed off of that right like that that gives oh. you like as an entrepreneur, you always kind of, I mean, maybe not, maybe you're not that kind of person, but I am. It's like there's, there, there are moments of doubt. Like, are we really on track? Like, is this time to pivot or is this time to double down? Like, are we, are we, are we really hitting what we need to hit? Is this like when you yeah. think about usability, viability, feasibility, like, are we hitting all three? Is there value? It's like, sure, yeah. we can do all three, but there's no value. It's like, there, there are sort of, there are dark moments. And yep. then there are these sort of kind of uh, spots of energy. Spots, yes, like a lot of lights. Like <laughs> you need of, them. Like, and tiny they... lights that kind of feed you and kind of illuminate the path. So, so that's 100%. One, uh, one question I have for you, uh, Boyan, is uh, I just find that like every entrepreneur has their unique edge. There's something unique about them, certainly the successful ones, right? What's yours? And, and they don't like the funny thing is you you don't become successful entrepreneur until you fail a lot of I, a lot yeah in most in most instances you fail more than once True. Uh, but then they will and it's actually those failures that make you more interesting like that, that's where you add value like if you if you try and you you hit it out, out of the ballpark on the first try like that's great but it's hard to really kind of uh condense that into into useful and usable insight right but you don't you don't get the tension until you hit hit it out of the ballpark like yeah very, very few people will talk to a serial no, entrepreneur it's like oh you failed so many times yeah come back when, you, when you're successful uh in my case uh you it's like what's the what's the unique edge my unique edge is is sort of dull so that's my yeah uh <laughs> like I, what I, I don't think there's something something sort of magic or dramatically different with me than than sort of every other person out there trying to kind of win it and solve the problem in in a new creative way. But I, I sorry, I enjoy pressure. I will, mm -hmm. I will. If there's no pressure, I will create pressure. It's like I'll set arbitrary uh, deadline just to sort of create pressure. Yeah, uh, that like, ability to sort of sustain pressure and enjoy pressure in a perverse way. That's that's important if you're an entrepreneur. Like, yeah. Life is sort of unpredictable. And, uh, and over long stretches of time. Yes. I I sort of embrace uncertainty because like you, you, when you're making a decision, 
there is a there's a there's data and then there's intuition and uh, like you're most comfortable making a decision when you have 100% of data that you want to have in order to make a decision. But I actually, I, I'm comfortable making a decision before I have sort of full confidence mm -hmm. that uh, this is sort of the, the right decision. I, I sort of embrace uncertainty. I'll try to make it and structure it in a way that it's sort of two-way door as opposed to one-way door. It's like, yeah. okay, let's, let's jump, but let's make sure that we can sort of return if we can yeah. but i i'm okay with this uncertainty like we'll figure it out like do we have everything we need like do we have parachute sure yeah. let's jump and it's yeah. like okay we'll read the instructions on the way down it's like we'll figure it out uh so that's so, uh, so, com so comfort comfort with ambiguity comfort with uncertainty and that combined by what you you describe as like you know your practical in terms of execution so that's a deadly combo by the way I yeah, think. <laughs> I, what, what I what I really what what I where I see kind of value in in some of the ways I I, I think about work and life. Like I'm sort of willing to be like I'm willing to be wrong and seek a better state because yeah I I do I, I sometimes I'll come across as as uh, potentially I might come across as sort of uh, confident and forceful. Because I'm confident and forceful, uh, but I'm also open to feedback, like sort of a strong conviction loosely held. It's like yeah. if if you disagree with me, like I listen to you. And more often than not, I was like, okay, this this is new information. I didn't have this information. We are going to adjust, and now I'll be better for it, and I'll be kind of forceful and 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 sort of with conviction, it's kind of slightly modified conviction. So that's sort of willingness to be wrong like say okay i didn't have all the facts that i wanted to have i made a decision that i made but it's the best decision i could make based based on, on sort of amount of information that i had there's new information like we make a new decision and you'll just punch to the wall and just it will be different one so that's uh and also have my wife like that's my that's <laughs> i was gonna ask like uh, all, through all these entrepreneurial gigs like did you have to go take permission and did you did you just get it instantly, or uh, how did that work with with your wife? <laughs> My wife is uh, it's like incredible woman. Like she was, she's 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 very supportive, and and she's uh, maybe more composed than I am. So she's she's really good sounding off board. Like she she's a really good partner. She she was never actively involved with the business, but I I sort of abused her time uh, to to sort of validate some of my thoughts because you like you're you're a leader and there are only so many outlets that you can go to to validate your your thinking like does this make sense or it doesn't make sense and uh and i i like i'm, I'm part of sort of executive groups and i talk to people but my wife is actually my kind of uh main advisor like a person that i'll talk to and i'll listen to and and, and she will she'll give me sort of quality feedback it's one of those like what would my wife do so uh, yeah, it, it has to be pretty stressful for her. But, <laughs> uh, she's she's managing. She's still managing. She's still here. Yeah, I, you know, I think an entrepreneur that can get through the journey with uh, family relationships intact, ideally in a better financial position and a good mental state, like that's <laughs> that's huge. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm pretty happy. Like I'm sort of, uh, I'm I'm a happy person. I may not come across as as one, but uh, that's I, awesome. I am I, a happy. I keep telling people I'm a happy person. They don't believe me. So. <laughs> I've got, here's the thesis I've always had, right? Which is, as entrepreneurs, you're really in the end often limited by your own mind, your your way of thinking. You know, how do you spend your day? You know, so what 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 has been your recipe for? keeping your mind clear and effective, despite all of that, that you have, I'm sure, had to deal with through this journey? Well, you, you sort of made, made, uh, made the assumption that uh, I keep my mind clear and effective. <laughs> <laughs> we, might, we might have to debate that, uh, <laughs> that uh, assumption, but uh, it's like, Nothing really spectacular. Like I'll I'll work out when I can. I like that. I uh like family bike rides. I, I really enjoy that. So Sunday mornings, Southern California, the weather is nice. 
we get on the bike and the ride around. So it's just having a bit of detachment from from hands on work. Like I, I will actually think about work. I think about work a lot, but like that's her, that that's her second second nature. So I I might be working out, riding my bike. If I'm not talking to to family, I'll be I, I'm most likely thinking about work. That's her. Physical activity helps uh, uh, reading books. Like I, I like to read, sure. uh, and uh, sort of carving out time, space, so you can kind of get some reading in, like get different perspective. Yeah, pretend that you're someone else. Yeah, uh, that's that's really helpful. To reset like every every morning. I wake up a new person. Like I every evening, I sort of reflect. It's like, yeah, am I better off in the evening? Did I learn something? Did I help someone? Am I like I'm just kind of better. At the evening, then or in the morning, and then I sleep. I wake up and say, like, "Ooh, new day." So, <laughs> so you're on. You're on to a new gig now. Tell us about that. Right. Uh, it's uh, so. So when I left, like when I left Helium Ten, <clears throat> I did not retire. <clears throat> no, my 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 voice voice is is betraying me. So when I when I left Helium Ten, I. Did not retire. Uh, first, I have, I have kids. I have, like at home, I want to be a role model. Like things things that drive you over time. Things that drive me. Sort of just being a role model for the people that are closest to me. I like. I just want to be productive. Like I want to be productive. Uh, I want to be present. I I want to sort of be impactful. Uh, and uh, I knew that I'm not going to retire. I I wanted to sort of leverage strengths that I have. And and some of that is the experience that I have and expertise. Some of that will be the relationships that I build. Some so these are the various things that uh, helped me get to where I am now. Uh, and I wanted to sort of build on that as opposed to start something completely new. This kind of the, the kind of I'm sort of incremental kind of person. Uh, uh, Melanie Nangal is the founders of Avask. I, I just joined. Uh, I just joined Avask as a, as a new CEO a few weeks ago. Melanie Nangal founded the company more than ten years ago. It sort of operates in the same space, but it solves it solves sort of a deeper problem for the same kind of customer that Helium Ten uh, serviced, which made it really attractive for me. Like they asked me last summer when they heard that I'm just spending my time or annoying my family. Uh, they asked me to spend a couple of days in England, visit the office, talk to people, and give them feedback. Like, hey, come here, let's talk. Like, tell us what you think about our business. And uh, I was like, I, I was sort of impressed by the level of energy. Like that was that was that was transformative and, and surprising. Uh, both Melanie and Angelus, like highly energetic, uh, highly experienced people, skilled in their own lanes, accounting, law. Uh, but then the team that they have, and it's big team, it's like 300 people. It's kind of hidden behind Avas brand. Uh, a lot of like. And, and can you describe? Can you describe what Avas does? Just yeah. in you know brief so, summary. So, uh, Avas Avas makes like reduces friction for for cross border expansion. So that, when you think about uh, expanding your your or growing your business, you can you can capture more customers in the existing market. Or you can expand into adjacent markets. So when you, if you're a U.S. brand and you want to grow 20% next year, you're going to make an investment, uh, and you're going to buy more ads on Amazon, or maybe you're going to launch new products, or maybe you're going to move your products to a new channel. So go Walmart or build your D2C brand. But one of the one of the ways to grow, especially if you if you if you already sort of established presence presence and, and saturate the market to the point is to uh, expand globally. So kind of US is sort of the largest uh, e-commerce market in the world. Uh, Europe is actually very close second. When you, when, when you think about Europe, it's sort of 80% of, uh, of uh, GMV uh, on, on sort of 15% or 20% more of, of uh, audience uh, than, than US. So huge market. It's a uh, it's large GMV and kind of a large uh, share of sort of affluent customers that are sort of culturally aligned. So it feels like very easy kind of kind of iteration on 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 what you already do. Then you go to Europe, 
you will find if you, if you're trying to bring your brand to Europe, uh, you will find, assuming you have your successful U.S. brand, uh, you will find kind of audience are willing to engage. So so that, that cultural barrier is is relatively low. There is a lot of demand, right? even if you're a European brand, kind of you're, you're starting from Spain or you're starting from Italy. So you're a fashion brand out of Italy. You want to expand to Spain or Germany. It's like there there is a lot of demand. Uh, the challenges that you will have as a brand is uh, are, are sort of primarily on sort of compliance side of things. There, there are solutions that will that will help you logistically, but then you need to kind of be compliant with different law, different laws and regulations in various European countries. So, so things that will kind of trip you are not necessarily your ability or inability to communicate to your audience. It's just be your ability to stay compliant with the regulatory framework. So what are the things that you need to do in order to transact in Germany versus Spain versus Italy versus, versus UK? So Avaz has been solving that problem for a number of years for a number of brands. And there are, there are more than 8,000 clients now uh, being serviced by Avaz, so addressing that kind of expansion opportunity. Like how do we grow beyond where we are now? And, and so Avaz, so internalizes that pain, right? It's 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 not easy. And I talked to our shared friend, uh, uh, Jad uh, Rawson from Piranha. So sure. I asked him a few months ago, like, hey, I was being coy. Like, what do you do if you if you have your brands and then you want to expand and they want to expand to Europe? Like, how do you handle that? And, and he told me, you know what? Like, frankly, I just tell them to not bother because <laughs> it's just too complicated. Too complicated. And, yeah. and if the answer is it's too complicated, that's that's sort of an opportunity essentially. Like it should not that should not be complicated. If you say, hey, there's no demand, sure, there's no demand, so why why bother? If you yeah. if you say it's it's challenging, it's uh, it's a uh, competition is high. It's like that's your opportunity. <laughs> okay, but it's like it's too complicated. It's like oh, I, I cannot deal with the kind of uh, getting getting license to sell localizing. Uh, getting packaging right because that the packaging has to be sort of adjusted for 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 Europe. It's like th those are the things that uh, Avask helps with. So if you think you're a technology person, if you think about sort of transformation that Amazon uh, did with their AWS with, with their mm -hmm. cloud offering, where mm -hmm. now instead of you having to set up your own data yeah. data center and 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 your servers in order to put, deploy an application that uh, delivers value to end user. That's what the Vaskis are doing with uh, with uh, uh, cross border commerce in Europe, sort of beyond Europe. So right. these are the things like you as a brand, you should not be worrying about things that don't deliver value to your customer. It's like, Makes sense. And you don't want to do it either. You're forced to, and you shouldn't be forced to. So that's right. that's what you do. I, I see huge opportunity. I see pain. Yeah. Like when you think through sort of uh, painkiller vitamin candy framework. Like there's clear pain, like, and also uh, uh, a pain in the way of uh, growth for brands, and that, that you know that 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 is uh, that can be pretty compelling. And so, um, so it's it, so much pent up demand. Like the opportunity yeah. is huge. You you have everyone sort of betting on growth of e commerce, and you have platforms, and you have demand. It's like you have everything you need, and even it's like I'm I'm not blaming local governments on on making things more complicated. The, the, those local jurisdictions, they also want to help and support, but there's only so much they can do kind of thinking through their existing framework. So there's a sort of clear need for a layer there that will abstract that pain away and unlock that growth, right? So no pain, more growth, like what's what's not to, what's not to love? Totally, there? totally. So uh, Boyan, uh, what, six, seven businesses later and the last one being extremely successful in our space, you know, you went from zero to sizable scale. Mm -hmm. What would your advice or message be for uh, entrepreneurs, especially in our space? And I know you and I run into a lot of them, but uh, what would your advice be? Uh, so the, there's that poem with uh, Gates, uh, like fail, fail better. Like yeah, try, yeah. Never, never try, never fail, uh, or ever try and fail. Uh, it's just fail, fail better, or fail differently. There will be, there will be lows, and then there will be highs for sure. It's like yeah. whatever you do, 
as an entrepreneur, there'll be a challenge and then there'll be success. Uh, I, I'd say like bias for action, like as folks from Amazon space, I'm sure we, we heard the value. Like you, you really cannot dwell too long as an entrepreneur. Like you have to, you have to make a decision, you have to execute. You have to be ready to fail. What you don't want to do is sort of fail twice. So like learn- On the same thing. Yes. So, yeah. so you don't want to fail the same way. Fail so the same way, yep. Fail, fail better, like fail yep. differently, fail better. So, so kind of embrace the pain, but make sure that it's not always the same kind of pain. So just kind of learn from your mistakes, kind of keep, keep pushing forward. That's a fantastic advice. I have a friend who keeps saying, you know, entrepreneurship track is like a sure short way to have like a, a floodlight, uh, completely focused on all your weaknesses all day long. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, so your advice and fail better, fail fast, don't dwell, move on, don't make the same mistake. Uh, uh, so valuable. Um, Boyan, this, I mean, honestly, we could be talking forever. Uh, this has been incredibly valuable. Uh, again, happy for you. Congrats on all the success and congrats on the new new role and wish you the best. I'm sure we'll have we'll find some ways to collaborate in, in your new role. But thank you so much for taking the time and taking and sharing all your experiences with us. Thanks for the opportunity, Srin. Uh, I'm still here. It's like I actually I'll be in England in, in a few weeks, but uh, the world is a small place. So we, we should stay, definitely stay in touch. Absolutely. Yeah.